guy. It's presenting the case, how to succinctly present the case and demonstrate that you get it. So you get what's going on. And um, so the aim here is to really try to simplify some complex situations um, or potentially complex situations. Uh, think like a boss and predict the critical issues. I, I go on about this point often for, for my senior trainees, but I want to just give you an ex example of that now as well. Um, when I talk about the critical issues is the fact that in any area of medicine and in any area of life, really, you will go through the bread and butter stuff of what you do, the day in, day out stuff time and time again. So you will eventually know what normality is. For example, in the anesthetic history, I mentioned that very, very brief history that you take. All of that's very normal. You'll get so bored of that, but one day you'll have a patient with some crazy AV malformation or some, or hemophilia, or they're a Jehovah's Witness having a multi-level, you know, lumbar laminectomy or something like that. Suddenly that normal case, the only thing that really matters because everything else is very normal is that critical issue. And so I think it's really useful to be able to summarize everything in a very, you know, practical way and also mention these critical issues. So what are the magic words? I think it's very safe to say age, gender, and the surgery, the risk level of what you perceive it is, high, moderate, or low. Uh, is it elective or emergency? Because that dictates how, you know, how much time you have to optimize or whether you have to crack on or not. And what these critical issues or main issues are. In our world of training, often we're in tertiary hospitals, so we're in the place that we need to be in. But say you're, you know, in a peripheral hospital, you're in the country, you're in a, in a just in a smaller center. Some, suddenly, that location actually matters. And when you, as you get more senior in your training and become a consultant, you'll make some very hard decisions about what's appropriate in that space, in, in this, in in the theater that you're working in, or not. I also start thinking, who do I need? And I, I just want you to think about these very consultant level think, things that you think about even now. Well, let's crack on with this. So after I say that, I can then say this phrase in more detail. So this is where you get down to the specifics if your consultant wants to learn more. So your consultant will really appreciate when he or she can glance at a chart. Just imagine you filled it with neat writing, all the relevant info that's written, written down neatly and in order. So again, see page six to eight. Um, but essentially, if you were to write down for a very normal examination history, just these things that you can see in front of you, no general anesthetic, PONV, family history issues, heart, lungs are good, medications, no allergies, uh, fasted with no reflux, and you've documented a decent airway exam. Once, once I glance at that, you don't really have to present that to me. You can just, I can just see that you've gone through everything. So I'm trying to try to, I'm trying with this talk to get you to mention the things where you're synthesizing what's in front of you and adding value to what you've already written down. Because I could read what you've already written down very easily. You don't have to say that to me. It'll be, it'll be boring for you and boring for me and add no value to the situation. So again, this is uh, take this and use it with judgment. Um, maybe some consultants want to know everything. Maybe they want you to speak it out loud. Um, but I, I get the feeling that you can mention certain things with this technique and get down to a lot of very useful stuff. And this is one of the techniques I'd tell my Viva uh, the, the students, the, the trainees going through their final exam as well. So to let emphasize this, once we've gone through all of these normal things, uh, we then go through, the, you know, we, I, I can easily see that you can mention what, what really matters to me. Example, you assess a patient, you panic a little bit. You then eloquently say to briefly summarize, there's an elderly male for a high risk emergency procedure. The main issues are critical cardiac disease and a BMI of 45 and the patient requires tertiary level care and input from cardiology post-op. So I'm hitting those points of, you know, gender, age, risk level, is it elective or emergency? And what are the main issues that I think above and above the normal assessment that I've done? Uh, and what do they, where do they need to be? And maybe who do I need? What services do I need afterwards? So let's give this a crack. This first one's a relatively straightforward case, but just see how you can add value and just present it literally in the way that I've just described. A 45 year old male presents inguinal hernia repair, past history of smoking, hypertension and cholesterol, very active. 45 year old male, inguinal hernia repair, pretty straightforward. It's a relatively low risk elective procedure. And I've just said a few cardiac risk factors, but I'm not really not concerned, great exercise tolerance. Um, and maybe I've discussed smoking cessation in more detail. And then I show the case scenarios. Uh, let's get to a few more interesting ones now. A uh, 50 year old female presents for lap collie, past history of hypertension, runs marathons. Uh, and then these are the scores. We'll go through the airway assessment stuff for those that don't know it. Malin Paddy 4 is a bad score. Thyromental distance of five is not great. And small mouth opening is obviously not great as well. Uh, so just say what you do to present that to me. 
um, using that same format. So briefly summarize, 50 year old female for a lap collie, relatively low selective procedure, dominant patient issues, exactly what you said, potentially difficult airway, and we can get into details uh, about how you would approach that in the airway section. But what, as you can see what I've done here, we'll go through this in a lot more detail. Difficult intubation due to what I've found, but I do then make the assessment that bag mask and LMA ventilation should be fine based on my findings. And I'll show you how we, how we come up with that later on. Uh, and my plan is like you said, use a video scope. Um, and just know that some of this may not be what you need to say. You know, the, uh, after a while, you'll you, you, you know you'll probably realize that it's just so obvious that this is a low risk selective procedure. Maybe you'll maybe you'll be able to just offer to your as you present to your consultant. Look, there's a pretty standard lap collie in this in this otherwise well patient. The only issue is she has a difficult airway, and then show them your chart. So I just want you to use your judgment um, to make it as most relevant and you know show your experience at identifying the critical issue if everything else is pretty normal and then showing your well-written chart to your anesthetist uh keep going 60 year old male presents for total knee replacement hypertension diabetic active reflux on even on an empty stomach and knee pain on 100 milligrams of oxycontin daily and that, that's pretty good you, again it's not not too difficult to identify that he's got a you know the, the main issue here is the post-op pain that might be difficult to manage and then you can go through in more detail what you do and my plan could be an rsi and usual analgesia regional spinal and or ketamine if i uh spinal ketamine if i decided that and again, my aim here is to, as you can see, a lot of these patterns of cases will slowly come up over and over again. And there's no reason why you shouldn't already know these patterns, uh, you know, as you're starting your anesthetic rotation rather than over two years. So again, just drilling a lot of these common concepts will make hopefully a rotation, at least the knowledge element, much easier. Uh, so that's, that's right, 60 year old male, total knee replacement, moderate risk elective procedure, dominant patient issue is an aspiration risk and may have post-op pain that's difficult to manage. And in more detail, I can go through whatever plan that I decide on. A 90 year old female from a nursing home with a fractured NOF, neck of femur fracture for open reduction internal fixation, uh, frail dementia, death, hypertension, cholesterol, osteoporosis, glaucoma, incontinence, and an unknown exercise tolerance. A very typical fractured NOF patient. Yeah, a lot of good things there. Um, so I've said, to briefly summarize, 90 year old female fractured NOF RF, um, I call it high risk because the mortality post operatively is, is quite huge and it's a palliative procedure. So you're right in saying it's urgent. You know, there's a ver there's varying spectrums of urgency. Emergency would be a ruptured AAA. Urgent would be something that you need to do in the next kind of 48 hours, which is definitely the fractured NOx. The mortality always increases after 48 hours and you don't really want to delay. Um, and it's often palliative, you know, for pain relief rather than any, uh, and, and a small mortality and, and a mortality benefit, but you're not, expecting you're not trying to do this to cure anything the pathology of this patient is in everything else as well and again i agree with what you said so dominant patient issue high perioperative morbidity and mortality maybe the nfr status and i always have a consent and family discussion about the palliative nature of the procedure um, and then in more detail you can you can go through all of that as well good 18, 18 year old female for tonsillectomy for a current tonsillitis no previous general general anesthesia very active but suffers asthma occasionally and snores heavily and reportedly has apneas recently had a cold also mentions multiple family members died or nearly sorry nearly died under anesthesia and doesn't know why uh obviously a bit, bit bit peculiar but let's go through it so i think this is an 18 year old female who's presenting for an elective tonsillectomy and what is likely to be a moderate risk procedure given her history of asthma and this unclear family history <laughs> Um, which I'd like to explore more. I suspect her main issues will be, um, well, this family history um, mm -hmm. and whether there's any underlying allergies mm -hmm. and also potentially a level of anxiety that might come with. Fantastic. This. And, and when you hear snores heavily and apneas, what, what are you thinking of then? Uh, I'm thinking also maybe some undiagnosed OSA. Fantastic. Yeah. And this is a peculiar situation because uh, there's always a, there's often a hospital will have a risk matrix of uh, OSA severity mild moderate severe on one axis and then the the risk of the procedure high mod, um, you know mild moderate severe risk and tonsillectomy or airway surgery while it's generally a moderate to low risk operation in OSA it's high risk for OSA complications with this airway surgery I would say something very similar 18 year old female tonsillectomy with potentially high risk issue there are multiple issues multiple deaths on anesthesia likely osa 
and like in recent OT with respiratory disease. So I'd have to make different decisions for each of those. And in more detail, I could, you know, go and make my plan. Um, and as you can see, uh, again, I'm trying to emphasize that if you, by highlighting these important issues, you, you get to the crux of the matter. Um, but your consultants are often used to hearing all the other stuff. So it's, it just shows a lot of clinical acumen when you when you start saying that. Uh, Claire, you mentioned multiple deaths under anesthesia being an issue and you mentioned allergies. So yeah, if I hear multiple deaths under anesthesia, actually, I want everyone to have a think about multiple deaths in the family under anesthesia. What conditions are you thinking? What, what are you worried about? Uh, so I'm worried about malignant hypothermia, sucks apnea, absolutely. Definitely anaphylaxis if other members have died, but doesn't necessarily run in the family. Um, but then the other one that is often not talked about is just congenital cardiac issues and arrhythmias that are, you know, in, that are hereditary. Uh, so yeah, that's that's the things I'd really want to think about. Often with the right questioning, you can take away these risks very quickly. Next one, 30 year old female, G1P0 at 29 weeks presents to labor ward with blood pressure of 160 or 90, headache, and some abdominal pain. Uh, so take about a minute or two and talk through your summary statement. There's a really good question about, is this surgical anesthetic risk? I'm just stating this as over my perception of the overall risk, because I think that matters to the way I approach the scenario. I don't get into the specific surgical anesthetic risk because uh, in this particular circumstance, it probably doesn't matter too much. I'm just giving my consultant and my team an idea of how concerned I am in, in that in this setting. So I would say uh, this is a 30 year old female who's presenting G1P0 at 29 weeks uh, with potential preeclampsia with BP160 headache and abdominal pain. So I think it needs to be worked up from that perspective. Mm -hmm. um, also to note is a 29 week Premi baby, so getting peds involved uh, as appropriate uh, early on, and just giving them that that heads up that the patient's coming. Fantastic, that's really great. So you've you not only ident so I've, I've given you some symptoms, and you've identified that it's pre you know it's preeclampsia, so it's a really fair call to make in this syndrome. It, it satisfies that criteria. You then say that you've seen that's a prem, so you know you want to get other people involved. Who do I need? Um, where do you want to be ideally? Where, which center? Uh, I think ideally, ideally in a tertiary center where you might have NICU on standby as well for a preemie baby at 29 weeks. Perfect. So I see this case, I summarized to my boss, 30 year old primate preterm, high risk, urgent obstetric issue, dominant patient issue is likely severe preeclampsia. It fits that criteria. And who do I need? OBS and NICU. And where do I need to be? Tertiary obstetric center. And just remember that you can keep adding layers as you gain more experience. As soon as I then see severe preeclampsia, I then think of my priorities of management, which the obstetrics should have started, but I'll always check for myself. Um, Luke, while you're there, and this is definitely an advanced question to ask, um, what, what are your priorities when managing severe preeclampsia? Understanding that you may have not managed it before. Uh, I guess blood pressure interruptively, but you're giving uh, high people to say that I people are pressure. Um, <laughs> and HELP syndrome, so coagulation, coagulopathies associated with low platelets. Beautiful. And eclampsia means, um, I mean, what happens at the end of? Oh, uh, and see, lowering three seizure thresholds associated yeah, with? Absolutely. Eclampsia. You actually mentioned the right stuff. So the, the primary goal here before operation is blood pressure control. All the more, most of the mortality events are due to high blood pressure intracranial hemorrhage. So I think blood pressure control seizure prophylaxis, um, management of other uh, um, other organ abnormalities, such as coagulopathy that you mentioned, and then finally, timely delivery of the fetus. Essentially, you wanna control all of those things and there's no rush to delivery. Those have to be controlled prior to delivery. So again, I'm just adding, as I gain my knowledge, I layer it onto what my priorities are as I as I learn, learn more facts. And then all of those uh, priorities then become their own management steps. Again, you'll learn all of this in, in good time. Um, but I really want to give you that structure to hang this stuff onto. Final one, Robert is a 74 year old male, ruptured AAA for laparotomy, rushed into the emergency department and you're there at the emergency department uh, reviewing this patient. Peripheral vascular disease, past history, had some cardiac stents, hypertension and the blood pressure is 85 on 40. Um, what are your priorities? Oh, sorry, not what are your priorities? What is your summary statement? What I've said specifically, again, 74 year old male ruptured AAA for laparotomy. This is high risk in his emergency. It's a very high mortality event to have this problem. Now, so what I, again, what I've done here, dominant patient issues, 
uh, just over with with experience, you realize that these cases in ED, one of the biggest things you'll have to do is just transfer urgently to theater. The only solution to this problem is a cross clamp, and that doesn't happen in ED. So often it's about getting the patient up to theater with a surgeon and the right team straight away. Uh, cardiovascular instability is a big deal, and that will then lead to a whole bunch of things that you mentioned, uh, and you will would have mentioned as well, which is, you know, big lines, monitoring, noradrenaline, adrenaline, whatever I need. And then you also mentioned the fact that very correctly that I need other people, you know, hematology, blood bank, maybe. So as soon as I have a blood loss case like this one, there's a whole team that's involved in resuscitation, massive transfusion. And you'll hear me talking about bundles of knowledge, which you'll slowly be able to gain over your time. So as soon as I see a blood loss in a case, I think of this bundle of care, essentially, which means, you know, lots of hands, another anesthetist, lots of nurses, level one for transfusion, blood bank, massive transfusion and hematologist, um, and then maybe even cell saver and perfusionist as well. And then finally, more surgeons, fast surgeons, and maybe ICU post-op. So that's just like a, a thing that I can always say, because every time I have a blood loss case, I need one or more of all of those things in a bundle together. And like you said, this should I, this should be done where it needs to be done because it's an emergency. But I, I, I use the phrase ideally done in a tertiary hospital just to make me think that I do need all of those resources. And I need a whole bunch of people, as I mentioned before. So again, just to summarize, age, gender, risk level, that's my perception of the risk level overall, elective or emergency or urgent surgery, dominant patient issues, critical issues, main issue, whatever you call it, location, if it's relevant, who do you need if it's relevant, and then in more detail, you can add levels to what the issues that you talked about. So just to recap, what we've done now is we've gone through pretty much all of the stuff I'd think about before theater. So just, just imagine what that means. I've chronologically gone through assessing the patient, a simple optimization steps, risk benefit profile, considering the highest risk patient for high risk surgery, um, how to do a very reasonable consent process. What are my surgical issues? I can make a basic anesthetic plan, hitting those high points of GA, regional, ETT or LMA, paralysis or not, which parts of the triad I need. What's my monitoring? Do I need to upscale that? Uh, what's my pain plan? Do I need to upscale that? And where does this patient go afterwards? And then I can present the case, identifying some critical issues, just to sound a bit more nuanced, sound a bit more expertise about what I'm doing. Um, and overall, I can you know do a checklist history uh, in, in neat writing on an anesthetic chart to show my consultant that I'm thorough as well. So hopefully that all makes sense to you that this is just chrono chronologically done. Now, before we go in, into the in-theater tasks, what I'm going to do is go through something that really blew my mind. So this next section is the patient with cardiac disease for non-cardiac surgery. 